you know, we are in a special place. I don't just mean in, in this lecture room, but I mean in general, you know, in the earth, in the universe. Um, you know, our, our planet is not too far from the sun, where it might be too cold. Although, you know, you could argue how cold it might be in the next few days. But, um, and we're not too close to the sun, where it might be uncomfortably hot. We're in just the right place, it seems. Um, the sun is not, you know, dangerously near some horrible black hole in the middle of the galaxy where things might be catastrophic or in the far outer parts of the galaxy where, who knows, we may have um, fewer interesting uh, collisions in the past that might uh, have affected our evolution. So everything seems to be just right for life to have emerged. And we ask the question, is this something special, you know, uh, or... Uh, is this just, just the way it is? And um, there, there may be um, other instances throughout the universe where we see this rather special combination of situations. And so we refer to this specialness as fine-tuning. And in particular, I'm going to talk about a special type of fine-tuning, the fine-tuning of the constants of nature, the fundamental constants of nature. And so they basically are important for us because they determine um, the chemistry that controls all the molecules in our bodies, in our brains, etc., And they have to be more or less just the right values. Um, if, if they were very different, then we might turn into, um, I don't know what, um, you know, pathological maniacs or something, or, or, or maybe we just wouldn't exist at all, you know. So there's a delicate balance in there, and I try to give you some examples of this balance. And so let me begin with carbon, um, which is a, a fundamental constitution of life as we know it. And then I'll talk a bit about stars and galaxies and the beginning of the universe, which we call inflation. So let's begin with carbon. But before I do that, um, I want to give you another example because um, this question of fine-tuning, you'll see it has theological implications. I'll mention that at the end. It also has philosophical implications. So philosophers are very interested in this question of, are we special fine-tuning? And so I, I thought I would describe to you the difference between the approach of a philosopher and a physicist or a cosmologist to this question of fine-tuning. So imagine that um, you're shown um, this picture. So imagine you have a, a, a lecture room full of um, philosophers and then one full of um, physicists. And each one of them separated. You, you show, put this picture on the screen. And, and, they, and you ask for their reaction to this picture of a black swan. OK. So let's imagine what the philosophers say. So they would look at this picture, they would deduce, you know, that, well, um, some swans are white, some are black, some are black and white, perhaps, you know, um, and they would conclude from what they see, at least one swan has a black side. And then they would ask questions, would, there, would the swan babies um, be um, left or right, and would they be, you know, would they be left facing forward or left facing backward, whatever, would the parity be the same as the parent, right? So interesting questions, fundamental questions about, about, about swan blackness. And then what about the physicists? Um, so they would say, well, you know, they would think about their experience. They would say, well, I've certainly never seen a black swan before. Um, and why on earth do we have this black, black swan? This could be a, a wonderful problem, a really important problem for biophysics for us to study in the future. And so then let me um, imagine a crystal ball, and I'll take you to the future of... Um, uh, philosophy and, and, and physics, where they study the black swan problem. And so for the philosophers, they would say something like this, um, the ontology and epistemology of swan asymmetry launched a whole new field of philosophy, postmodernist empiricism in the multiverse. Okay, So this, this would be their research that we can visit for many. And the physicists would have a more practical approach. They would say, that they managed to persuade the funding agencies to launch major initiatives to study um, biophysics and distant planets, exoplanets, on the origin of black swans. So you, you can see there's a, there are different approaches to this. So philosophers and, and physicists have, have rather different worldviews. I'm going to give you today the physicist's approach to, to fine-tuning. Okay, so let me begin with um, the story of carbon. And it, this is really one of the most amazing stories in, um, in astrophysics, I would say. And it really um, begins with um, Fred Hoyle. He's the one who cracked this problem. And now he's very famous um, for the steady state theory of the universe, um, which um, he detested the Big Bang. 
um, uh, thought it violated all common sense principles. He said, why not imagine a universe which recreates itself as it expands, which was known at the time. Galaxies form out of nothing, basically, and so it always looks the same. Anyway, um, this was shown to be um, wrong eventually because um, observations proved there was a, a very different past. There was evolution and, and extreme heat in the past, so that couldn't be the city state universe. Um, but... Um, you know, and, and his motto was, things are the way they are because they were the way they were. So we think this is wrong, completely wrong now. But he did do something amazing, um, uh, made the most amazing prediction, not in the field of cosmology, but in something closely related, actually. Chem you can think of it as chemistry or the origin of all the elements, actually. So it was believed um, that you had to make elements in the universe by nuclear reactions, by building things together. And this is how the sun is, is made, it is, is powered by hydrogen meeting helium thermonuclear fusion. Uh, and so we understand pretty well how helium is made, but you want to understand how in the hot centers of stars, or maybe in the Big Bang, you, you, you can go up to the next step, carbon, which is critical for life. So it's one thing to get, um, for hydrogen atoms to come together, nuclei, and make helium, that happens easily enough. And we can even do that with um, you know, our thermonuclear bombs, for example. We're waiting to do reactors on the ground, but that will come eventually. But how do you get to carbon? And so the trouble is that two heliums make an atom of beryllium, which you can make in, in reactors and reactions. But it turns out not to last very long. And you have a very hard time for it to stay around long enough to capture another helium to build up to carbon, which is, has the mass of three equivalent helium nuclei. And so what Hoyle said, and this was a pure um, speculation, hypothesis at the time, there's only one way to do this. We have to somehow make um, uh, carbon um, have a much larger effective probability of existing and you can think of this as an effective size. So you have to imagine the carbon um, or the beryllium nucleus sort of oscillating in size, and we call these resonances. And then briefly, it can be very, very large. And that, it's like you know, catching a baseball. Suddenly, the beryllium can catch the extra helium, and, and then the helium, then the, the carbon that you make, then you know, becomes a normal carbon. We call this a resonance. So he predicted there had to be a resonance. In, in the nucleus of helium at a certain energy. And the amazing thing was, three years later, laboratory people measured this. So he made this prediction. He said there had to be carbon in, needed for life. This is the only way we can do it, because it's very abundant element in the universe. And three years it was found. So I think this is one of the most amazing predictions. And that, so the Hoyle, justly speaking, should have got um, a Nobel Prize for that. He didn't. Uh, I'll show you why in a second. But so th th this is the, the story then. We have a star um, which you know, lives uh, it's massive. It burns up its energy very quickly. Um, and it and undergoes nuclear reactions. And it makes first helium. And then uh, as, as it burns out the center, the helium makes carbon. And uh, thanks to Hoyle's wonderful, won wonderful idea. And, and then eventually the star becomes unstable. It runs out of fuel, basically. Explodes and, and you know... Um, pollutes all the medium around it, and then here we are, right? New stars form with lots of iron and carbon, etc., and the, the planets too. And then, so these were the um, people that Hoyle worked with um, in the 1950s to come up with this, with this theory of the origin of the heavy elements, in particular carbon, which he... Uh, and um, th there were two astronomers um, and um, a nuclear physicist who was um, very good at doing the nuclear calculations, but Hoyle, who really had all the ideas... And, of course, as often happens in physics, um, eventually Fowler was acknowledged for the Nobel Prize. Uh, the others were not for various reasons because they were all somewhat special individuals who had many other types of theories that maybe were not totally acceptable. To Nobel no one really knows why because the records have been released since. But anyway, it was a, a great accomplishment, but Hoyle never received sufficient credit for his wonderful prediction about carbon, which I think uh, merits much more. Anyway, so um, now he... This is the best example we have of what we call fine-tuning, because carbon had to be very, very special to, to, um, to have this resonance which gave you, it allowed its production. Um, if it didn't have that particular piece of nuclear physics attached to it, we wouldn't be here, life wouldn't be here. So, and um, now you can argue, where did this come from? I'll come to that as we talk more. OK, so that's um, what I wanted to say about... Um, about carbon.
Um, let's now move on to the more general question of stars. So I want to show you that stars, too, are rather special things. Um, uh, stars come in a somewhat limited range of masses. The sun is somewhat typical. Um, there, are, there are more massive stars, less massive stars, but relatively speaking, they, they form a certain narrow range. Um, so why is that? Um, and let me try to give you some feeling for what is special about a star. Um, but um, first of all, um, to know what a star is, you have to know how we count stars. And, and the person who um, had the biggest influence on where these elements come, come from, um, and in fact got the whole idea wrong, partly wrong, but I'll explain that too, it was George Gamow, um, who was um, a Ukrainian physicist who, who escaped from um, Stalinist type um, Russia and went to live um, in the US. And there he, um, he worked on the Big Bang and the fact that the universe went through a very hot phase um, that was really his idea, and was able then to cook all the elements by nuclear reactions. So a famous quote from his, the elements were cooked together with many particles in less time than it takes to cook a dish of duck and roast potatoes. He wrote many popular books, wonderful writer, and he had one way expressing himself. So in, in the first few minutes of the universe, he said all the elements would have been made. Now, he was right and wrong. He was right because, um, indeed, um, some of the elements were made in the helium, which is after hydrogen, the second element in the universe, that was made, we now believe strongly, as Gamow advocated. Um, and all this within the first half hour of the universe. So Gamow was sort of a practical joker. Um, a famous colleague of his, um, Hans Bader, who was in fact the father of the idea that stars are powered by nuclear reactions, um, uh, he was just a friend of Gamow who added his name to hit the paper he wrote on the origin of the elements, without beta even knowing, to make the symmetry of alpha, beta, gamma, I guess. <laughs> and uh, anyway, that's, he was a joker among many other things. So here he is, a little older, along with his student and collaborator who um, came up with this wonderful idea. OK. Um, but so Gamow really believed then that um, all the elements, not just helium, were made in, in the first few minutes. But he, he was wrong because it was soon realized that, um, that there were problems with that because of this, this um, you know, to, to make carbon, you have to have three elements come together, three helium eventually. And because the universe is expanding so rapidly, there simply doesn't work in the Big Bang. So people realized that eventually. But at the time, in the 1950s, Gamow was still very pushing very strongly his ideas that everything was cooked in the Big Bang. And there was a famous conference in 1953. And he's a slightly younger Gamow um, over here. And he was giving lectures explaining that all the elements were made in the Big Bang. Why? He said, well, look, I just look at the stars. I count the stars. And I simply don't see enough stars. And he knew that the big stars were short-lived. They exploded like into supernovae, as I showed you before, the idea of Fowler and Hoyle, etc. But there are so few of them, they cannot possibly give me all the carbon I need. Um, and there was a young man in the audience called Ed Sorpeter, who was newly PhD, just learning about astrophysics, actually. Um, and he sort of you know, listened to, to Gamow's lectures. And, you know, this just isn't right. This is the most famous cosmology of the time, but he's saying what I think is nonsense. Why? Because Sorpeter realized that because these big stars were short lived, when you count stars in some volume in some cluster, you're missing all the ones that have died. And if you ask how many were made there, you come up with far more. And then you could solve the problem. And so that was Saul Peter's great idea some um, 60 years ago now. And he realized then, so the distribution of masses when they were born, when you look at this is a star cluster, two of them, an old one, a younger one. But when you count up all the stars there, you simply are missing all the dead stars. Okay? Now, the younger ones last, the older one, the low, less luminous ones last for a long time. So you're not missing those. They're always there. But it's the, it's the bright stars that die quickly that you're missing that were there when that cluster was formed. And so that gives rise to what we call the birth function of stars. And so all I want to show you here is what this means in, in, in a simple way. So this is the mass of a star. And this is the number of stars you find in some region, like this, where there's a wide variety of stars. And so you find that some stars are, are low in mass, like the sun, basically. And so the sun is, will be somewhere over here in this, in this range of masses. Um, so this is where the sun sits. It, you can see the sun is not the lowest mass star. There are, this is the numbers of stars, and the sun is outnumbered by stars which are roughly a half or a third of the mass of the sun. 
But there are no stars very, very low in mass. Then you run out of stars. So there's an interesting range between roughly maybe 20% the mass of the sun, 10%, and then all the more massive stars. And so these are the massive stars, which go up to 100 solar masses, 100 of the sun, and they explode, okay, and they're short-lived. And Saul Peter had cleverly figured out the idea to, to correct for that, and this is which is the dragon for the, for the birth of stars, how they're born. And so what he realized, well, all these stars that are not very bright, the lower mass stars, that they basically give me all the mass in regions like this. They, if I count up, if I ask how much total mass in stars there are, that I have to make sure I have all the most numerous ones. But I asked, what about the chemistry? Which stars are exploding and making the elements like carbon, et cetera, et cetera? It's the stars which weigh more than the sun because the sun has not exploded yet. It may never explode or may turn to something and will be a source of elements, heavy elements, but that'll be long in the future. But it's the more massive stars that have done that. And so he said, well, you know, I, I count, account for mass in this part of the region. I account for the chemistry of everything by looking at the stars that exploded. And finally, when you look at galaxies far away, it's the very few stars which are really, really bright that I see. And they account for why galaxies, when I take pictures of images, are really so bright. And so it's curious then, so you can take the full mass of stars at birth and you say, well, some give me mass, some give me chemistry, and some give me light. Okay, so that's, that, that, was a, that was a revolution in the field of astronomy to suddenly realize this and realize that stars are, are the basic, you know, building blocks of everything, right? Chemistry as well as mass of galaxies. And so we now have, are in the era now of um, space astronomy where we launch satellites like this space, space telescope, um, which was designed to look in the infrared, a three and a half meter telescope, huge thing. Um, and um, when they launched it, um, they actually had to unfold it from the body of the spacecraft. Um, special t technology to do that, and anyway, and so, and, and, and it went into an orbit um, on the far side of the Earth, with, so the Earth blocks much of the sunlight for some of the time, okay, and so that's also a million, a million miles uh, um, away from us. So that, and so that was up for some, <clears throat> you know, nearly five years or so, taking these beautiful pictures, and this is a picture of a region where stars are being born, and all the blue stuff that you see is essentially the effect of the hot stars going through their death throes, being incredibly bright, ejecting lots of energy. And um, so that's how we can see massive stars at work. And in these darker regions around them, you see that's the womb of stars still being born and, and um, less massive stars that don't die in any spectacular way. So this is at the birth region of stars. So that's sort of a wonderful thing to see now with, with modern telescopes. OK. Um, so now let me try to give you some feeling for where all of this really comes from um, this idea of just stars having a fairly narrow range of mass. On the diagram I showed you, we talked about the smallest stars being a fraction of the sun, a third, a quarter of the sun. The most massive ones, 100 times the sun. But in, in the grand scale of things, that's a very, very tiny range. I mean, why do we worry about why are stars in this? This is another example of fine tuning. Of all the masses there could be, there's a narrow part of space, of the space of numbers in which the stars are situated, I'm sorry, piece of masses. Okay, so the first person that gave this some very deep thought was Isaac Newton. And um, this is a quote from him in which he realized that with his theory of gravitation, he could understand if he took some very large cloud, it would become unstable to gravity. And that simply means that fluctuations in the cloud would have a little bit of excess gravity and they would start pulling stuff in around them, excess gravity, and it would fragment, it would break up into bits and pieces. So this Newton realized, and um, he never actually really publishes. This was in private correspondence to uh, um, a colleague called Richard Bentley. Um, so he now, I don't know how seriously he really took it, but this is what he wrote. And so, and so he said from this process, then this might be how the sun and the fixed stars are formed. And then he went on to think about this some more and realized he was a slight problem. So the sun and the stars shine but he was well aware there were lots of things around us, planets, that don't shine, right? That just shine by reflected light from the sun, if you like. And so he couldn't understand this. Um, and he, at that, this point, said he, he didn't understand why some stars shine and why some are opaque. And he said, I do not think this expli explicable by mere natural causes. And he was a religious man, and um, went on to higher authority to understand that. But that did not stop James Jeans from pursuing uh, his argument and showing that 
first what genes showed was that there was a very natural um, region over which the, these clump, this cloud would form clumps. And he thought these clumps would naturally be stars. And these clumps could also be planets as well. But genes, all genes did was really give the, the, put in some real physics to Newton's ideas and say this is the way to make things. But he did not address the question of why stars. And so it took a third person to do this, Eddington, Arthur Eddington, um, who, who really had um, the key idea in this entire story of what is a star, what is special about a star. So you can imagine you have a physicist on a planet that's perfectly covered by clouds all the time, and she can never see any star, doesn't know that stars are there. Okay? Well, she can do a calculation, which physicists love to do, okay, on the backs of an envelope, if you like, and one could realize that if you consider globes of gas, um, and put in the effects of gravity, that if I make these globes too big, they would get so hot that they would just blow themselves apart eventually, just by the sheer pressure of radiation. And so he was able to calculate, Eddington, that this happened at roughly 100 times the mass of the sun. And likewise, if you made the globes um, too small, um, that they, they would not be able to support themselves either. Okay? And so there's just a narrow range. And he said, from this... The physicists could infer there had to be stars okay, in, in the sky, even though one had never seen them. And so, so this is physics telling you, theoretical physics telling you there had to be stars, even though you've never seen a star. So that is also an, an, amazing, an amazing idea. Not really a prediction, because he certainly knew there were stars. OK, um, but it helps us understand what's going on, that things are a bit special out there in the universe. OK, so what is it then in a slightly more specific way that determines the mass of a star? So a star is a balance between two fundamental forces. Okay? So one is gravity, which tries to compress things. And the other one is pressure, which balances gravity. And so it's a titanic battle between the two. And the pressure is simply caused by um, electromagnetism, if you like, the effect of atoms and, and, uh, and plasma and molecules basically having heat and balancing with pressure, balancing gravity. So it's a tonic balance between those two. And you can show that there's just one number that controls this balance. It's simply the ratio of the gravity force to the electromagnetic force, the two forces con concerned between a pair of protons. So you can express this fundamental ratio in terms of one number. Okay, in, And it just contains constants that we, we know we've measured, like Newton's constant of gravity, the mass of the proton, the charge of the electron. It's all that goes into it, actually. And you come up with this very tiny number. And this number is really the key to everything. It may seem so tiny, but this ratio of forces tells you gravity is a very, very weak force. So what on earth can it do in supporting a star? Well, the reason is simple, because if I have charges, and we know there are negative charges, electrons, and positive charges around pro protons, basically. Um, and if I add them all together, electrons and protons, the net charge is zero. Okay? So electromagnetism cancels itself out eventually. So, so that's, that means that even though gravity is so incredibly weak, when I have a large enough number of particles, then gravity can really balance the effects of, of electromagnetism. And that really is what this tiny number tells you, and that's what gives you the, the, the key to the mass of a star. OK, um, so when you then, um, that's the most important thing, actually. So some ratio of fundamental constants tells you what the mass of a star is um, and gives you roughly the right number. So now we realize that life is slightly more complicated because there are these stars that explode, the most massive stars. There are stars, um, the smallest stars. So if you make the mass of this object, which will be a star too small, it will not be hot enough in the middle to have any nuclear reactions. And so it does emit some light because it's very slowly contracting, but it's not very bright. We call these things brown dwarfs. They're stars which would be stars, but simply don't have the energy to become stars. So they're brown dwarf stars, they're called. They're not really shining very much. Um, and then um, the third natural scale in the whole problem is what the sun will become in a few billion years when it runs out of all nuclear fuel and eventually becomes almost black. Okay? And we call that a white dwarf. Okay? And so there are three sort of mass scales in the problem, ranging from 100 times the mass of the sun to a tenth the mass of the sun, with something in between to the fate of the sun. And all of, these, all of these numbers are essentially boiled down to this ratio of fundamental constants with some very tiny modifications. Okay, so they could be, you know, billions and billions of solar masses. They could be tiny, tiny fractions of one solar mass. But in fact, they're all, you know, all these numbers are within a factor of 100 or 1,000 of 
the mass of the sun. And that is what is amazing. We call that an example of fine tuning. Things are a bit special in making stars. If these numbers, these constants of physics were very different, if G were very different, the mass of the proton were very different, the ratio of the electron were very different, we simply would not be here. We would not have these stars making this nice environment for, to, to warm up the Earth, etc., and make good into life. So it's all very interesting. OK. Um, so just to take this one step further, I thought I'd try to give you some feeling for where this cloud that Newton conjectured, how that ends up as a star. And, and so this is where the ideas of genes come in. So genes said, well, this cloud fragments, and he gave the condition for that. And the condition is that if I look at, um, so this is how the, the, the cloud changes. So it's getting denser and it's breaking up. This shows you how it breaks up into lower and lower masses. And that was genes' idea, basically. And then it reaches a minimum value. Um, and after that, the, the bits, the lumps become um, so opaque, they cannot lose energy, and they basically just start growing, basically. There's a minimum value. Okay, and that was what we called the genes scale, the genes mass, this minimum scale for a, for a cloud to give you. So that was genes' great idea. But then, uh, and we can um, express all of that, again, in terms of this wonderful fundamental constant. It's just some... some, some, some value some scaling of that fundamental concept that controls the mass of everything to do with stars um, with a slight addition to give me this small number. Okay, but then genes, not so much genes as people after him realized that this was simply not good enough that we did more detailed calculations because this mass simply was not the mass of a star, it was a bit too small. But what we realized was that, um, everyone realized was that, you know, this clump is sitting in a cloud and the cloud just, you know, gas falls onto it, so it grows. We call that accretion. Okay, so accretion then is the way stars get to the mass range that we see, like the sun. But then there's another problem that comes up. If things are accreting gas, why couldn't they keep on accreting and accreting and become too big? And so this is the ultimate complication. And what I'm going to show you is how we solve that problem. And basically, it's a question of complexity. And I'm going to repeat that again and again in this talk. Complexity intervenes to take us from the fine-tuning to something that we actually live with every day. And here's the example of complexity. So first of all, this shows you from numerical simulations how gas sort of accretes. Gas come, these are magnetic field lines, which we see everywhere. And gas basically falls, comes and slides down the lines and basically makes big clumps of gas. But then... When a clump of gas tries to make a star, the, the, the gas has some spin, at, or we call it angumentum, and basically that twists the field, which gives you magnetic pressure, which stops gas falling in. This is what we call feedback. So this complex situation involving magnetism basically is what is needed to understand stars. So it's not as simple as simple fine-tuning of the fundamental constants, but that is a major part of it, and the rest is complexity. So it's a combination of things that's, that's coming in. Okay, uh, and, then, um, and then here is, um, again, one of the great discoveries was, I, I mentioned Beta, who was primarily responsible for this, that the, the sun is a nuclear fusion reactor, a controlled one, fortunately for us, and um, this is the source of its energy, why it shines, and hydrogen turns into, fuses into helium. That four hel helium is slightly less in mass than the four hydrogen nuclei, and that Missing mass, extra mass, gives you energy by Einstein's famous E equals mc squared. That's, where, that's where, why we're here, basically. And so it turns out that as you make a star more massive, it becomes a very profligate burner of nuclear fuel. Okay? And in fact, its radiation goes up as the cube of its mass, actually. Um, and that means that if I ask how long does the star live, because it's such a profligate burner of fuel, and it's only got its mass as the fuel supply, that means as I make them more massive, they're very, very short-lived. And the lifetime goes down as the square of the mass. Okay, so a star that's 10 times the mass of the sun will only last for 1% of the sun. So the sun, we think, will live for about 10 billion years. But a much more massive star will only live for 100 million years, and the most massive ones of all for a million years, which is a tiny time on the cosmic scale of things. And because that's such a mere incident of the universe, that means we should see many, many dying stars. We should see stars in the throes of death around us um, because, you know, one looks at many stars, they're, they're born at different times, so some should be dying before us, and that's what we see. 
So our galaxy is full of dying stars and um, lots of stars that are long lived like the sun, far more stars that are like the sun or less and will live for, and the lowest mass ones will live for much longer than the sun. Okay, so um, there you have um, my story on, on stars. Um, let me now move on to um, the next stage in thinking about what there is in the universe, why things are special. Let's consider the Milky Way, right? A collection of uh, 100 billion stars or so. Um, and there are many, many galaxies we see. There are billions and billions of galaxies out there in the observable universe. And they, they are obviously environments where the stars are forming. And so we better understand what is special about, about a galaxy. Why is a galaxy not enormously bigger, enormously smaller. What is special about a galaxy? Okay, um, so a galaxy, I said that stars were a tussle between nuclear energy and pressure. Let's think of a galaxy in a slightly different way. Imagine some huge cloud that wants to break up into stars. We, have, we certainly have gravity, that's very important, that will help it fragment. But what the competition with is the cooling, uh, the dissipation, loss of energy of a clump. If that clump of gas can't lose energy, it can never get dense enough to be a star. So I have to think of this now in a more global way on the scale of the entire galaxy. Can my gas cloud, gigantic gas clouds, we see them in the universe, how does that become a galaxy? And so there's something um, from atomic physics. Again, we calculate the ability of this gas cloud to lose energy. And it turns out that at a certain temperature, it's prolific. Um, this is hydrogen, this is helium, which give you lots of energy, uh, basically atoms, uh, have levels of electrons that get collide with other, with other atoms that push the electrons up. The electrons then jump down again. They give you energy. So that's the way things work. Energy comes from basically collisions between atoms. And so there's a temperature range over which this dominates. And then if you, if you apply this on the grand scale of things to everything in the universe, all the galaxies we see, we find there's a beautiful thing that emerges from this. So this is the typical density of the cloud. And this is how hot a typical cloud is. Just properties of any arbitrary cloud in the universe. And so this, bit, this question of can the cloud lose enough energy so it can make stars is delineated by this dashed line. Okay? So you can see that um, there's a region here where things are possible, where you can um, basically lose enough energy. Okay? So that's, that's the story. Um, and if you plot on this curve all the galaxies we see in the universe, and these are you know, dense galaxies we call E is for elliptical, S is for spiral, our Milky Way will be over here somewhere. All the galaxies seem to lie within the bounds of this region where, you know, galaxies can form where cooling, atomic cooling, is allowed. And finally, we have the big things in the universe, the huge conglomerations of galaxies called galaxy clusters, which, you know, are, have, they have not collapsed together. They have not made one, giant, one mega galaxy, and they lie outside this critical region. So that's sort of a, a scientific way of showing you how in a cloud that will form a galaxy, a protogalactic cloud, things divide up so galaxies do form exactly where we see them, um, which, again, is, it's an explanation of why things are the way they are, okay, in terms of the simplest possible physics that goes into the constants that determine gravity and the rate at which atomic levels can lose energy. And, and then, um, just to um, uh, show you, uh, ignore all the various numbers on this, but, but th this is the numbers of galaxies that we see. So the blue line is, the, as they get more and more massive, the blue line is what we, what we observe. Okay, so we, we see very few supermassive galaxies, and we seem to see more, small, more and more low-mass ones, but suddenly over here there's nothing. But in the theory, um, is, it's a bizarre theory. It's a theory which is due to our understanding of what the dark matter is. So the theory as we have it now doesn't agree at all with the data if you just take the theory at face value and don't add complexity to it. The theory says there should be far more small galaxies and far more big ones. And the way we've addressed that problem is to, again, add a complexity level, which we call feedback, and that's this. Um, when, when clouds make stars, some of them are massive, some explode. And in the small galaxies, which don't have that much gravity, they drive the gas out and you stop making any more stars. So that's an example of how exploding stars can destroy the smallest galaxies and don't affect the big ones because the gravity is strong enough to hold the debris in. And what affects the big ones, we think, are supermassive black holes. Again, a discovery um, long after this simple theory was advanced, but we find that in, 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 in every galaxy there is a, a monster in the middle called a, a giant black hole, and as gas falls onto it, it emits lots of energy, and that can drive out the um, much of the residual gas in the cloud around it, 
and avoid your making too bi many big galaxies, really big galaxies. So that sort of is the way things go. And um, so the message is, yes, things start off by some combination. This is the typical mass over here where things do actually match up, involving only the fundamental constants, but then after that, you have to add complexity. OK, so um, that's uh, maybe more details than you really wanted, but, but here you can see are the types of galaxies we make. Um, these are the tiny galaxies. We call them dwarfs, where clearly you've had exploding stars. We think we've had so much interaction early on with, with stars disrupting the gas. So th these are just shreds of galaxies. You can barely see them, just little piles of stars. But these are galaxies. They're called dwarf galaxies. Ones like the Milky Way, uh, you know, uh, are very effective at making stars. And then the big ones, inside this one, there is a, a really massive black hole, which again limits, limits the mass it gets to. So that's sort of the way, the way things are. We interpret the universe. A mixture of fundamental constants and complexity. OK. Um, right. Um, OK, so um, let me now take a step backwards. And um, that... that that, those are the details I wanted to give you on, on, on the stars and the galaxies, but now I want to tackle a much broader problem, which is um, the beginning of the universe. So we have a wonderful theory um, of the beginning, um, which is called the inflation theory. And so this is a summary of the history of the universe. And so here we are today um, with lots of galaxies, and stars in the galaxies, of course. And then as you look back in time... Um, maybe 400 million years ago, you come to the first stars, and we're just beginning, we're still beginning to learn how to look for these with the biggest telescopes we have. It's a major project for the next decade to find direct evidence of the first stars, but we conjecture they should be there because these first stars were what polluted the stars that we see with their heavy elements because in the beginning there were no heavy elements. Um, you needed exploding stars to make that, as, as I mentioned. Uh, but it, then if you look back, before then, we do see the, the fossil radiation from the Big Bang. This is the glow of light from the very beginning. And, and what you see um, on this are tiny ripples, which are due to fluctuations in temperature from place to place. And these are seeds of the galaxies. These are ripples in density, which eventually grow bigger and bigger and make these galaxies today. Um, that theory convinced us that sh they should be there, and we've now measured them in this, uh, in this light pattern that we call the microwave background. We see it in gravity. And so what is now pure conjecture, but we, many of us believe it's the right track to go on, is that there was a beginning that we can't see directly, and there was a period of um, enormous expansion called inflation. And in that inflation period, there were, there were tiny um, fluctuations created that gave rise to these ripples and then eventually the galaxies. But the universe indeed began from some incredibly dense and hot phase and went through some enormous expansion to get to be as big as it is today. Otherwise, we'd have a very hard time expanding it. So this is a theory that's very popular. Um, and let me try to explain why. So it's a theory that um, makes three pretty incredible predictions. So one is... Um, that space is very, very close to being Euclidean in geometry. That is, the three angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. Um, and we measure the curvature of space experimentally by looking at distant galaxies and seeing how light bends, etc. for various lensing, we call it. So space, we say, is flat, in the, like, like a plane in the Euclidean sense. It's also enormous. Okay. And here is how infl the inflation theory explains this. There was very early on a phase transition. I mean, the familiar one to us is um, ice melting into water, which does release some, some energy that you find under the surface of the ice sheets where fish can live, actually. So in the same sense, there was a period 10 to the minus 36 seconds after the Big Bang, very, very early, where there was a transition in phase from one type of matter, the generic type, to the more practical one that, that we the type of matter that we see around us, um, and that released so much energy, the universe went through a dramatic expansion. And so this shows you how this dramatic expansion, in a cartoon form, you could start off with some very you know, irregular type of universe, geometry depicted this way, if you like, cur curves in, in the curvature of space, curvature of space, and, and that would then expand to something incredibly, like a balloon, incredibly flat, and be enormous. So those are, inflation 
we love, most of us love inflation because that seems to be uh, two explanations. And there's a third, a third argument, which is really nice too, is that in this process of rapid, expa rapid expansion, inflation can also explain the fluctuations that, that are necessary for us to be here. We need ripples. And if, this, if this was totally smooth, you'd never make galaxies. You need some seeds in density to, to see the galaxy, which then breaks up into stars, right? So the, the starting point is where do these seeds come from? And unfortunately, we don't really have a theory of the very beginning that that's where we need to somehow embrace quantum theory and uh, gravity theory. We're still looking desperately for, for, for unifying theory of everything. But apart from that, we know that inflation does, a, does take, once you concede there was a, a fluctuations in the quantum sense at the beginning, or even though we don't have a fully we can't integrate fully into, our, into the way we look at things, then those can, because inflation can be translated into very large scales as you blow up the universe, and those can be the seeds from tiny to big of the stuff we see. Now, again, that may seem pure fantasy, but this is what we observe. Okay? So this is the cosmic microwave background as measured by the Planck satellite. Um, these are tiny fluctuations in the sky at the level of basically one part in 100,000. So these are microwaves. Ignore the colors to give you some sense, but the, the same microwaves that, that you tune into on your TV, and if you go in between two channels on the TV, then you see all this static on the screen. 1% of that static is the cosmic microwave background to give the universe. It's just an amazing thought. You can't, you know, you can't really, it's the, your screen is too noisy to do much more than, than just say that, but now we have special telescopes, this one, the Planck one was launched into space for, and took data for a decade, which can then measure tiny ripples in this background. And, um, and these are these, these seeds from the beginning. And what is amazing, the reason why, this is not a proof that the theory is right, the reason why we're confident that we're on the right track is that all of this pattern of the sky, you can ex explain with just six numbers, okay, um, which are essentially the, come from cosmology and the theory of inflation. And so you can't predict what those numbers are, but we measure them. And the fact that it takes six numbers to explain this incredible complication, complex phenomenon, suggests that you know, when you can simplify things like that, you know you must be on the right track, even though you may not have the ultimate answer. So simplicity does help a lot. OK, so um, having said all that, there is one serious problem okay, in cosmology. And so you imagine all these cosmologists sitting around the table, and there is something that they're not realizing that they have this model I showed you has to cope with, and that is what we call the dark energy problem. So here is the dark energy problem summarized for you. So this pie diagram shows you what the universe is made of as analyzed from experiments like the microwave background experiments. So there are atoms, a few percent of them, that's what we're made of, okay, ordinary stuff. Um, then there's the dark matter, which we haven't actually found yet, but we're confident it's there. We have many candidates for it from particle physics. We haven't found them yet, but it's, it's a good option. But most of the stuff we see is what we call dark energy. Uniform, but it's there, it, and it accounts for the fact the universe is accelerating. How do we know that? But when we look at distant galaxies, we find supernovae, exploding stars um, around them, and we know exactly how bright such a supernova has to be. They're basically perfect bombs. And when we look at nearby galaxies, fine, it all fits beautifully. When we look at the most distant ones, they're too faint. Too faint by 20%. That's a huge effect, 20%. And that's only understandable if the universe is accelerating. And therefore, the galaxies are further away than the ordinary should be. And this, this, is, the, this is the argument, really, that there is this accelerating force, which we, is what dark energy does. So the trouble, though, is, is that while we observe a, you know, in the universe some rather small energy, if you like, that gives this acceleration, the theorists predict something huge. And so I'm not going to tell you how they predict this. It comes from particle physics, from our lack of understanding of the quantum origin of the universe, that we can infer that once things are very hot, and therefore there are lots of energy there, and we can estimate what the energy is. And we have no idea how this energy can cancel itself out. It was expanded. So we assume that's what we're stuck with from the beginning, from our best theories. And we measure something very different. And the difference in numbers, never mind the units, is 120 factors of 10. Okay, so this is a wor worrisome, and it's been called the worst prediction in physics. Okay, so um, so we're not there yet, right? So what do cosmologists do? Okay, so um, here is one explanation, um, and that is if you go to inflation, there are variations on inflation now, um, very respected ones, I should say, which produce not one universe but many universes. In fact, almost as many as you like, and so. 
Each of these is a universe being predicted by inflation, each one of these. And here we are, this is where we are, and we can see out to a few billion light years, and we live in some very big universe, and that's, that's where we are, and there are all these others. Okay, and because all you have these other, all these other universes, we call that the multiverse, then each of them could have a different value of dark energy. And lo and behold, if dark energy is too big, they would accelerate so quickly, you'd never form stars. And, um, and so you're forced to a very tiny regime of sp parameter space, if you like, where dark energy is very small, more or less the value that we see. So we call this the anthropic, anthropic reasoning to make us humans come into the picture. And so the multiverse is said to explain one explanation for why the universe um, is the way it is, why dark energy is so small in apparent conflict with what we might have expected from physics. So this is not necessarily appealing to everybody. So here is one of the main promo promonent, proponents of um, the multiverse view, Leonard Susskind, who argues that um, we live in one tiny pocket of this vast universe, vast multiverse, where things are just right with our kind of life. Yet, if you think about it, how on earth can you possibly see what's going on in another universe? And that's expressed um, vividly by George Ellis, who says, the multiverse theory can't make any predictions. It can explain anything. OK, so here we are. We have two different views of the universe. OK, so um, there's a basic problem here. OK, so in order to say that something's improbable, you have to know how to, how to place a bet, right? That means you have to know how to calculate the odds. And the biggest problem we have with the whole theory of inflation is that we have no idea how to calculate the odds, the chances of it giving you many, many universes. Um, and let me give you one example. Um, in the universe that we know, leprechauns, fairies, are very rare. Okay? They're much rarer than people. If I take an infinite universe, then believe me, there are just as many fairies or leprechauns as there are people okay, out there somewhere. Okay? Because I have so many possibilities. Uh, so this is clearly not, and I can't calculate the ratio of two infinities. So it's impossible to estimate the odds of this, right, once I go to the multiverse. This is the problem. Okay, so here is a very old idea on how to address this problem, which is the one I'm going to conclude on today, okay, and give you some examples. So it's called Occam's Razor. So um, William of Occam lived in the um, 14th century. And he advocated the parsimonious view of nature, okay? That is, um, you want to take the simplest possible description of things until you prove wrong, then you add a little bit more complexity, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, the simplest possible. And if I take Occam at face value, um, then there is only one universe. I don't want to add all this complexity of almost, an almost infinite number of other universes to... Uh, that's just crazy, right? That is simply not being parsimonious, not being simple. And Einstein loved this. Um, his, he, he, his quote is saying, everything should be kept as simple as possible, but no simpler, right? Okay, um, so where do we go with this? Okay, so um, Occam's razor is not necessarily a good principle, okay, in the universe that we see around us. For example, suppose you want to predict the weather in two weeks' time, okay? Um, you will find that um, you cannot do this now. Okay? No matter you put the biggest computers to work, all the data we have at the moment, you will never get a reliable weather prediction in two weeks. Maybe you'll in the next few days, but after two weeks it becomes totally chaotic, impossible given our present computing strength. Okay? So um, this shows you that complexity, chaos and turbulence, whatever goes into weather prediction, is playing a huge role at some point. So the principle of simplicity cannot really work, right? So one has to be careful. Um, some people have said that Occam's razor is a double-edged razor, you know, et cetera, right? Okay, so let's um, think about then, as, as a credit for the, for the, for the multiverse, but let me finish by telling you the implications for something else that Occam was worried about, and many people in previous centuries, today still, and that is the issue of intelligent design, okay? Um, because again, if I find something incredibly complex, then you have to worry, you know, what lies behind this? Is, is there just one, one set of numbers that laid out at the beginning, um, or was there something else uh, behind all this? Okay, so the story really begins with, again, William Paley, um, 18th century, who said, let's imagine I'm um, wandering on a heath somewhere, um, and I come across a watch, a pocket watch, uh, a very complex 
you know, thing, okay? Um, what does this mean? Okay, so when I see this watch on the heath, he, he says that um, someone must have dropped it there, of course, um, um, and um, it was made by a person, by a watchmaker. Um, you can't say that this came about by natural forces. You know, he, you know gra- I talked about gravity and all the other constellations. Ha- that they couldn't possibly uh, get to the stage of making a watch for me. Okay. And so, right, so this idea um, appealed very much to many people over the years, and Newton in particular, um, uh, this summarizes the, the viewpoint in earlier centuries um, that the mechanical perfection of the workings of the universe um, you can think of that like a, a watchmaker, and he said, well, the watchmaker must be God, therefore, right? So, so, you know, this then led to what we call the whole view of intelligent design. But, you know, things didn't stop there because Darwin, Charles Darwin, made a major discovery after that, okay, of natural evolution. And in some sense, this provides the answer because it shows how the watchmaker can develop, okay? You don't need to appeal appeal to some higher being to make the watchmaker directly, okay? You can appeal to natural selection. So Darwin's view was, um, you know, that you can basically, um, we can no longer argue that the beautiful things hinge of a bow valve shell must be made by intelligent being. Uh, like the hinge of a door by man. There seems to be no more design in the variability of organic beings and the action of natural selection than the course which the wind blows. Everything in nature is the result of fixed laws. Okay, so um, that I would say is, um, you know, the majority take today on this. Um, and, um, you know, so I would say fine-tuning um, certainly is present out there in the universe. It was necessary to, to form carbon, Stars, galaxies, um, black holes, I haven't talked about those. The beginning of the universe, I gave you examples of that. There are special, theology has been, have been examples that this has been applied extensively. But, you know, really, it's all a matter of complexity, actually, and self-regulation and, and the laws of physics. So given those, then one can explain all of the phenomena I've talked about. Okay, and so that really is, um, is the bottom line. Fine-tuning is simply a manifestation of... Um, of complexity of nature and um, complexion. Nature can do marvelous things, so thank you.